This podcast is based around the history and experiences of the infamous Shane Bugby. Recollected and retold by Shane Bugby himself. Who is Shane? Well, you're about to find out. I'm your host, Nanaral, and this is Speak of the Devil. Turn on the mics. It's all about Mike today. So, when you search Shane Bugby on YouTube, one of the things that show up is this interview gone awry, where young Shane from 20 plus years ago is on the news. He was flown to Chicago to pitch in his insight regarding censorship and publishing a an infamous comic artist. And um, during this interview, Shane is not sober. And it's it's actually quite funny. But what isn't funny is that this particular artist was arrested for expressing himself. So today we're talking about another infamous character, an outlier, an artist, someone named Mike Diana. So... Tell me what happened. Why did he get arrested? And why, why of all people, did Mike Diana get arrested? There's been plenty of terrible cartoons. Oh, well, it's so hard for me to talk about Mike because he's another one of these betrayers in my life. Like, he's got the doc, he, you know, like we talked about Hail Satan in the first episode with Doug. And, and he's another guy who cut me out of his whole history, even though... Oh, it's it's upsetting to talk about this guy. But Mike was back in the day. We would exchange. He would ex, he would send me comics for my zine, Naked Aggression, and um, he owed me some artwork and told me he couldn't turn it in because he was arrested for the comics he did, the the zine he did called Boiled Angel. And at that point, I. Uh, Stepped in and said, well, if you can't, he's like, I can't publish anymore. I'm under, I'm, 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 I, I've been arrested and I'm going to court for this. So he's, he was afraid to publish. So I started publishing his stuff. And so, um, we event, he eventually went to court and he was, uh, for the, he was one of the first artists in American history to be busted for obscenity in a way where he was arrested. They, they searched his home for artwork. They, I, I believe is probation or parole he couldn't make artwork anymore but it's been a long time um me and mike had a great friendship much like me and doogie um did uh, the satanic temple fame um and and i i uh published mike's work for probably a decade i dedicated a decade of my life into that the, the free speech and his efforts um, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. Oh, absolutely. Directly um, because of my emotional ties to it. But. I, I understand. Um, what's amazing about this is the internet in 2019 is rampant with really obscene artwork. And yeah. it goes from very sexually explicit all the way until just flat out Jim Crow era and Nazi propaganda racism. Actually, before we go on with Mr. Diana, I wanted to mention to you in a a piece of obscene artwork that uh my partner and I debate over if it's valid that it exists. It is an image of the character the character Shrek and Batman. And they are parents expecting a baby. And Shrek is pregnant with Sonic the Hedgehog. And this illustration has the statement above it, aren't you glad you can see? And <laughs> of all things on the internet, this is what my partner cannot stand. He thinks that it should be eradicated from existence. He can't stand that I bring it up all the time. That... As much as I think it's disgusting, too, I love looking at it. I love... It, it's a weird schadenfreude that I had for um, just... It's like watching a train wreck. It's so terrible. It 
it's too disgust. It's such a disgusting idea, but it's also sort of gratifying to look at. <laughs> so tell me, what was in this artwork? You know, it's funny you bring up that you bring that up. I always thought I was carving back uh, twenty five years ago or something, mm-hmm. like thirty years ago when I started mm-hmm. publishing Mike Diane, and and I was doing Mike. I was publishing before Mike Diane and Michael on publishing, and I thought I was carving out myself a niche to be an obscene publisher, not pornography, but obscene. You know, like all the works that that were hard for people to swallow. I was going to publish those books, the obscene and banned books. That was me. And then the internet sort of put me out of business. That's, you know, I've said that before. Internet has made obscenity obs- obsolete. And and by the definition of obscenity, it's about community standards. It's, it's, it's uh, what's, as Stuart Baggish from the Mike Diana case said, what's acceptable in the bathhouses of San Francisco and the crack-ridden alleys of New York is not acceptable in Pinellas County, Florida. And so Mike just had a lot of anti-religious stuff in there. But there was... Uh, he, I think I said a quote in the reader when I published that book and I was interviewed in the reader. I said, if people want to see pictures of flowers, artists making, our uh, artists uh, drawing pictures of flowers and beautiful things, and they need to make sure the world is a beautiful place to live in. And Mike lived in Florida. He was surrounded by drunks and and drug addicts, and and he's you know he's from the lower zip code. He's a lower class person, much like myself, who come from the downtrodden of the society. And so I really related to his artwork on that level, at a class level, as I do a lot of things. And so he was just documenting serial killers in the news, you know, stories he was reading in the news. He was illustrating the uglier stories in the great tradition of underground comics. He was taking on things that were taboo or ugly. And so, um, that's, that's what was in his, in his work, you know. So I just did a quick Google, a boiled angel comic. And one of the photos I see is this picnic of these white people, this white family. There's a kiss the cook apron on dad. His dick is sitting on top of a crying kid. There's another kid reading something that I bet is not appropriate. And then. There's this, you know, mother clutching her pearls. I told you not to read these books. They'll turn you into a deviant just like him. So I'm guessing the little boy is reading Boiled Angel as well. Um, this cover is it's saying the worst of Boiled Angel. So it's sort of a compilation. That's the one I put out. I put that out. And uh, when I put that book out, and again, see, I put out all this stuff. I'm blown away that I'm cut out of the documentary. You know, I wasn't even consulted like the do- the the documentarians never contacted me, not didn't ask me one question about Mike, even though we spent all that time together back then. I did the first Mike Diana art show. So that stuff, you know, when we talk about Mike Diana, that's what I have to, I, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty angry about the whole thing, to be honest with you, um, that we were friends and he did what he did. It was a, it was a deep betrayal. Yes, I put that book out, and 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 to put that book out was a dangerous thing. Then, you know, we're putting out dangerous work, and um, it's not like putting out a book like that's going to make you a million dollars. So I I I I dedicated myself to those politics, to that you know to the the idea of expression of free speech. And when I put that book out in that cover specifically, the Supreme Court had just ruled, I believe, that drawings or artwork of children in sexually compromised positions was just as bad as actual pornography, actual child porn. So by rights, that book was deemed child porn, even though it's artwork. And it's ridiculous to say that a piece of artwork is child pornography. There's no victim. It's artwork. You know, so but but to say that the same thing was was a heavy thing to publish that book, that book at the time, you know, it was uh, last gasp. The distributor last gasp wouldn't sell it unless I put a sticker over the the dick and the child's head. Much like the tipper stickers. Yeah, I had to put a big sticker over the cover, destroying the cover to get a distributor to sell it to make back some of my money. And um I, I know that all of those books go for a lot of money online now, but it was a really controversial moment 
and to be willing to publish that cover as a publisher back in the day i was held in heroic status for pushing free speech and pushing the envelope um you know and again that's that's really i'm so bitter well i shouldn't say i'm bitter at this point i'm i'm uh, i guess becoming used to it but but to be cut out of that documentary the mike diana documentary is is uh i don't feel it's just no I, no it's I, not i think that also the um it's very upsetting that you defended such a thing you stepped forward and put your name on the line with this artist's work and then to get erased when something better comes up, unfortunately, it it's sort of like selling out. Yeah, and it's weird. I wonder if I get erased. That's how I wonder. I wonder about who looks bad in the in the historic picture of it all. Like for their documentary, they cut me out, but I'm not cut out of history like I'm in books and I'm in magazines and people know that I did this. I got a bunch of emails when after people saw the documentary at some film fest wondering why I wasn't in it. How many and years know, ago was this documentary? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, a, a couple, like just a few. Okay. Just a few years ago. And and it just blew me it blows my mind. Like people people contacted me and and there's another person who filmed while we were when me and Mike were young and while this was happening, Mark Hayner, he filmed the Gigi Allen documentary as well. And he hasn't released either of these, but he was right there for it. And he emailed me and told me not to worry. He's got the real story and, and uh, got the footage of us being young and doing all this stuff and to not worry that my story will be told or our story will be told. But I, and I just wonder who looks bad in this historic context or, Modern documentaries seem to be more propaganda pieces or infomercials versus an actual documentary because I don't mind not being in the documentary per se. Like like if they're funding, they couldn't get out to film me or I just don't look the right part. But as a documentarian, I would want to call every person I could to get stories out of them to ask great questions. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Versus Versus sculpting a story, my idea of what a documentary is from my day is that you follow the story and let it unfold. And as it unfolds, you find things you're like, oh, my God, I meant to make a nice picture about you. But now I found out this this part of your past or this, you you know, I find out this. What do you have to say about yourself? You know, and, and so that's how I see documentaries. They unfold if, as you're as you're filming them. They unfold. You don't go in and go, listen, we just want these, these, these people to talk about this case. I mean, I, the, the, as me and Mark Hainer, I think discussed over Facebook messenger, it was like obscenity is obsolete. W what good is a propaganda piece on Mike Dana going to do now? You know, talking about obscenity, it, it, it serves no purpose. It censors the obscenity and makes it a safe piece. Yeah. And it's sort of the only purpose it serves is to get Mike off of people's couches. Let's say it's like a big, it's a, it's a grandiose, uh, job, you know, resume, a CV, like, look at Mike has a documentary about him, put him, put him in a gallery and, you know, put him in, in your museum or something. So it's just like an, an advertisement, an infomercial. And, and I took that case and I took what was happening to him so seriously as an, as, as a, a citizen, let's say, as or just a human being, like I feel like expression is so important to our evolution, even ugly expression. I just could not understand it. But I come from the Frank Zappa school of thought. You know, like when I grew up, I watched Frank Zappa and the PMRC hearings, the tipper sticker stuff. And he would talk about when they would talk about the heavy metal lyrics inspired this person to kill himself. He's like, that album has sold 10 million albums. 10 million people haven't killed themselves. 10 million people haven't committed violence. An insignificant number can cite artwork, you know, that as a motive for what they did. And so I always thought it as reasonable like that, like you could take an information and it's not always going to make you want to hurt yourself. Not, it's usually not going to make you want to hurt yourself or it's never actually going to, make you want to hurt yourself it's it's other issues you have that would 
make you want to hurt yourself. Before the internet, how we would sell his books is drive around the country. Like a traveling salesperson? Absolutely. When someone in Ohio was like, man, I love it. I'm so sorry what's going on for you guys or for Mike and you know my publishing company. And so, I'd, hey, let's set up a, a show there. So we'd set up an art show and go down there and sell artwork and, and sell his comic books and stuff. And that's how I, I chose to spread the word about that. And I know I think I think there's a you know like a reputation that I, I, I took the money and ran. I got all the money from the Mike Diana stuff. And I thought that's I, I think I've heard that before. And I thought it was so funny because there's no money in obscene books. You know, we spent all that money traveling, trying to promote Mike's case in a way that he might get help for his case. Or spread the word about what was going on before pre-internet, before before obscenity was obscene. Let's say even when the internet started, there was still some censorship happening. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it wasn't the internet wasn't what it what it what it is today. And we were into some radical stuff. I don't think they want to talk to someone like me either because there's like Mike has stuff in the, his books with white supremacy in there, you know, swastikas. So we were into heavy shock value, as you know from the Might Is Right show or anything else. We were into some heavy, we were into all the taboo stuff, serial killers, rape, torture, any fucking horrible dark subject we were exploring. It doesn't mean we were advocating that stuff, but no, it was definitely. It made way for also skate art. Look at all the skate art with like, look at the art artists who did the um, artwork for the 90s brand hookups with all these big titted nurse nurses holding syringes or these yeah. other you know th- that like 90s when skateboarding suddenly wasn't so criminal but the artwork you see a 14 year old kid wearing a semi you know a kind of soft core looking image of a woman on their shirt and it's perfectly fine right right exactly and it, it did make way for a lot of freedoms that we have today that people take for granted in art and expression Look at Super Jail. Have you ever seen Super Jail? What is that? Super Jail is a cartoon on Adult Swim. And it's it's the one that I sent you an image of. And there's a, uh, there's a warden of it that kind of looks like Willy Wonka. There's a... Um, there's like a prison guard who looks very questionable with red hair. And then uh, there's kind of chaos going on in the background. The the illustration style is very similar to Mike Diana's illustration style. Those people definitely owned copies of Boiled Angel. And guess what? There's swastikas on some of the prisoners in the show. And there's so many parts where the the show uh all hell breaks loose and everyone starts stabbing each other or like wreaking havoc and it's very detailed in the background. That style wouldn't exist without Diana and without your publishing. Right. And there's an, uh, there's a, there's a definite evolution of that, that it's a class type of thing. It's hard to document a lower zip code, white trash class of person. It's hard to make artwork and not put swastikas in it and stuff like that. Cause you see that neck, right neck, like that's your neighbor. Mm-hmm. Like that's just like, other cultures, you know, when you're on the low zip code, you're you're going to be around biker gangs, gangs, whatever kind of gang, you know, and that's what you see on the lower zip code, and that's what you document. It doesn't mean you advocate it. It it's it's, but somehow you, it triggered you, you know. Somehow it triggered you. Maybe you are excited by it. Maybe you you are into that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. I uh, knew Mike for a long time. And I know that Mike is a big kind heart. His brother was pretty angry. And we, we would say really obscene jokes. We would we would listen to Johnny Rebel and laugh. But we weren't connected with everyone. But I know that me and Mike both have, we have big hearts. And as an artist, as artists, we're, we're pretty generous people to, to be honest and, and to share that stuff with people. And I think that sometimes artists are confused present day with politicians like i don't neither of me or mike were pretty apolitical if that makes sense we were we were not looking to push hate forward necessarily 
but we were pretty angry growing up in the neighborhoods we did because it was dismal. It's dismal to see people drunk all the time, on drugs all the time. I just, and I know we'll talk about Michael Hunt Publishing in another episode. I just went back and talked to someone who helped me start that company. And to watch, and to, and I, I'm at home now. I just came home after running from my past for 20 years. And I've landed back in in my homeland, in the Midwest, and to see and to hear the stories of every single person I know who's been through multiple divorces, who's been through abuse, has been abusive, drug addiction problems, alcoholism. It's like not one person has escaped that. Not one person. I mean, you're going to get ugly artwork from that. And I always wished, I did, you know... I'm happy Mike has a documentary about him. I just wish it was a really good one that was true to the what the class struggle and the, the what we saw, what we were documenting, what we were pushing forward. And I really wish museums would fill up with things like the artwork that Michael Hunt published, the publishing company I did put forward, or the black metal, you know, black metal music stuff like that is from really angry areas and. I think you have to explore that to get rid of it or to, to, to heal it. I think there's, it's like, now as an adult, I can see it. It's all like cries for help or something like, you know, if we were looking to be accepted, we certainly wouldn't have made that artwork. Right. And it's, how is it any different from someone cutting themselves to try to alert someone in a nonverbal way that something's happening? How is this different from showing the psychologist or right. the judge where he hurt you, where he touched you. Right. And we're, we're looking in a very primitive and artwork is very primitive when it's done correctly, I think. And I think there's an idea that you want someone to study it. You want answers. You want someone to tell you, you know, it's like going to a therapist or something. When they say artwork saves lives or people say artwork is my the greatest therapy I have. I mean, if I didn't have artwork, I'd be dead. This there's music, t- this album kept me from killing myself. Right. There's a reason there. We're trying to understand something that's in that poetry of that song or in that poetry of the artwork. That is saying like, and it's violent, it's angry, and it's aggressive. And then people that are well-adjusted will listen to it and go, what the fuck is your problem? I don't know. You tell me. Tell me what pill I need. Tell me what pill my mother needs to get out of this hell. Because we're in a living hell. Look at how you're, um, uh, before before I lose track of it, um, I keep wanting to (laughs) jump in here and mention that, um, when you are raised around drugs, around white supremacists, around violence, something like that, there is something that sort of makes that familiarity almost endearing or humorous because it's so familiar to you. So sometimes yeah. the expression of humor within something such as Boiled Angel, it, it is funny to a fault for some people, not to everyone. It's sort of like, you know, laughing about a, an angry father in a show that hits his child and you sort of laugh about the child being smacked, even though it's terrible. It might be terrible that it happened, but you might be laughing because your dad hit you. Yeah, and you laugh. That's just a, some sort of psychological thing. Someone uh, smarter than me can explain, but you laugh or you cry, they say. It's sort of a release to see something that's close to home. Even if it upsets you. And I think that it did speak to a lot of white trash. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. When we went on book tours and stuff like that. Yeah. And that that was our that was our people, our lower zip code people. That's always been. And it's it's been weird to be away from that stuff and be really sheltered out in the Pacific Northwest and come back to the Midwest and see it. I'm really dealing with that now, trying to process it. And it, I couldn't do that right now in the snap of a finger. It's so heavy on – it's weighing so heavy on me. But I know that when I think about Mike Diana, I think about the betrayal and why my feelings are hurt over what he – why he cut me out of that documentary and stuff and all I did for him and everything. And then I 
you know, I can't help but think about the good times we had and the love that we, we were good friends and, and, you know, I had a grand love for Mike and, and, um, boy, that was for fun times and we really struggled, struggled through. Um, but Mike was definitely from the lowest end of the spectrum. Like Mike would show up in Chicago on an airplane in the middle of the winter in, in tight shorts and a Dago T Dago. Haha. <laughs> I'm part Italian. I can say that a Dago T and he had no winter jacket on nothing. It's the winter in Chicago. It's 30 below. He's coming from 70 degrees. So he, he just was, he's just such a unique creature and he was so delicate and, and, and kind. It's, I believe Mike and me are some of our, our unifying factors is like an Osbergers or something like that where we just think differently. And, and within that context, we had a really cool friendship obviously, or I wouldn't be so hurt that I was excluded from a documentary that most people that were around in the day think I should have been in. It would have been an interesting story. I think, I think a very interesting story if it was Mike and Shane or something like that. But I think also maybe part of it is I, I've done so much in my life. A story starts to become about me and what I've done versus the people I've worked with. And so I can understand cutting me out. I don't know. It just bothers me. The, it, it definitely bothers me. You know, I know that my old partner alluded to the fact that it was because I wasn't nice to people or I was a hard person. And I thought that was really funny. You'd think that if that were the case, I would be really wanted to be, you know, like, hey, there's this character who's an asshole. Let's get him in this documentary, you know, because... You know, I, I'm a I'm a person who's going to say stuff that other people won't say. I don't know. I, I'm sorry to keep going back to that documentary. No, but, but perhaps the publisher wasn't the one who had that say. Maybe someone on Mike's side didn't want you in there. And indeed, maybe Mike himself. I know, like I said, I was always accused of stealing the money or taking all the money and running. And I just always thought that was a funny, a, a real funny concept based based on how much I gave to all of this stuff, like the the generate you know like what i dedicated my life to isn't something that helps an old man get you know 50 year old guy get a job yeah i put out obscene books that were banned in florida and i, I put out the you know i was satanic fucking revolutionary books and <laughs> you know where do you go with that where do you go with that a lot of people take very great measures to bury or erase people who might steal their thunder and ah. perhaps it's their way of here's their chance in the spotlight. This is their big break to do whatever their version of get out of the hood that they have. And if someone else is there, and in reality, it probably won't water down their story, but their own insecurities get the best of them and make them a very ugly person to the person they hurt, to the person that they exclude. I've had plenty of times where I had my hand in something or pulled a lot of weight. And when the finished product came out, I wasn't part of it. And sure, I have the proof. I have the experiences. But moving on from it is hard. Even if you got paid, even if you get the credits somewhere on fine print that you can use for your own CV or resume. At the same time, the damage is done. The scars are there because... Yeah someone ripped a scab off someone you know did a hit and run basically and ghosted you there's that levee concept of uh, credit where credit is due and i think about that when you're talking saying that it's like boy isn't that that's something that's very attractive is giving credit where credit is due and that was very attractive in the levee stuff to me is giving credit where credit is due and i think this is that's part of the reason you know like I don't know. I think as, and as artists, as artists, it's almost like a fucking crime. You know, like what you're talking about happened to you, happened to me. It's like it's like such an insecure thing. But when I grew up in a working class neighborhood, my father was a pipe fitter, which is like a plumber. And when he lost his job, other pipe fitters would help them him find a job. What's so funny? Nothing's funny. 
You're right. Nothing is funny. Nothing's funny anymore. Everything is offensive. So I'm going to say this on the Mike Hunt episode, and then I will let you continue your story that I rudely interrupted. You you defended earlier that you are part Italian, and here you are talking about your father was a plumber. Oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) I get it. I get it. it. I'm so stereotypical. That's true. We'd get pizza every night he got paid. Every week he got paid, too. You know what? So do I. Did you? With my gold chain and velour tracksuit on and everything. (laughs) OS for life. Take it easy. OS for life. (laughs) I forget. I, I forget what I was saying there. Your father. You, yeah, he was a plumber, and, and other uh, pipe fitters would stick together and find him a job. So I always thought that's the way the world worked. But you get into the art world, and no motherfuckers would cut you out at the ankles to get get a spot, just to get attention, just to work for free. To work for free, they will cut your throat. And it's like, what in the fuck is wrong with you people? And I think that's like where we meet classes, like. There's all classes of people are involved in the arts, and 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 you can be a rich person and make really great artwork. You could be a rich, painful, a pained, uh, feeling human being and have come from uh, wealth, uh, privilege, and still create great artwork. And I think that's we start entering the you know it's it's a whole different world. But for me, I just you know like like I say this documentary for me it was a chance. It's a chance for me to earn money. Every every little. Like I earned that. I did a lot for Mike. I did a lot for his case. I did a lot for his story. People were going to forget about him. Here's something. I went down to Playboy. Playboy is in Chicago. And I went down to Playboy and I demanded they do a story about him. And I, I, I wouldn't. And they're like, just leave it at the desk. I'm like, no, I'm not going to leave here until I talk to an editor. And I'm a, I'm living in my car practically. I'm like a fucking piece of shit, white trash, a total fucking junior high education what the fuck am i doing going up 150 floors of the playboy office like you know like in this big building in downtown chicago but there i am and i'm like no i'm not leaving until i talk to an editor and so i kept going back day after day i'd sit in that lobby for eight hours a day for like a week and finally an editor comes out and he talks to me and i'm like listen you've got to do this and he goes you tell me one reason why we have to do this story over other things i go this is going to set a precedent and eventually it'll trickle up to your ass you think things trickle down all the time, but this is going to come up and affect you and they'll start making laws and covering up boobies and everything else. You'll be fucked. And he's like, son of a bitch, you're right. And they did a story about Mike and things took off. And so, you know, that's the kind of stuff I was dedicated to free expression more than Mike, more than myself. I didn't even, you know, at that, that age, I think about myself and I was invisible. I was felt that small. I felt very small person. I didn't feel loved, you know, so all those things reflect in my artwork and what I did. But most certainly I was able to put it into a, a the concept of free speech and expression. And I was like fought, fighting for something that I believed in, you know, with my whole being in life, my whole life force, every dollar I had. And, and, and that's that. I remember this other publisher, Last Gasp, Ron Turner from Last Gasp, he he published underground comics and all of a sudden he said, I can't take Mike's books to me as the publisher. And again, I go, Ron, you can't do this. It sets a precedent. If an underground publisher won't take his books, we're, he's going to go to jail. And Ron's like, I'm not risking it. This is really fucked up stuff he's putting out. And so MTV and all these places were calling for interviews with Mike. He was a big deal. It was like the two live crew case all over again. And so I started saying, you can't talk to Mike unless you talk to Ron Turner from Last Gasp. And so they started calling Ron Turner to interview him and ask him why he was setting this precedent. And like two hours later, Ron calls me after I gave out like six people his name, including MTV. Because MTV was a big deal back then. I don't know if kids even know what MTV is today. Music television, first videos, rock videos, music videos. And um, so Ron calls me, he goes... Listen, I'll take 200 of each book, you son of a bitch, and then he hangs up. Because so I forced him to distribute Mike's book based on its precedent setting if you don't do this. And that's how I felt about it. Like, you know, as artist community, when someone's in trouble, you you got to stick together. It sets a precedent where it comes back on you. You know, free speech is something you have to defend, especially because you don't like it. Especially because you don't like it. 
because it comes back on you once they set the precedent. You know, it's even though today recently we're having the discussion about Nazis having free speech and and I sort of a that concept I would like to discuss more because I get it like you can't give it's hard to give free speech to someone who wants to take away free speech. You can't give them the tools of speech in order so they could take it away. So that's a I get that. The fine that. line of the opinion versus the platform is very fine. And usually when the person infiltrates that fine line and creates a platform that they're basically brainwashing and censoring other people, it's too late. And we did not see that coming either. Right. And and, and see, now you're talking from, you know, like platform and that's a young that's a young word. And, you know, before the Internet, it was free speech, I believe, when I think about the concept. You know, I've been involved in tech since the beginning, too. First podcasters, everything. So I'm I'm a little progressive with that. And so for me, I've been involved in the free speech thing the whole time, before the Internet and after. And I think before the Internet, the concept of free speech is an individual thing. Like, I have this right to say what I want in my house and out my door and to my neighbors. But when you get on a platform... And you have 10,000 followers, you have a responsibility and you, you do have a responsibility. And I'm not sure what that is, but it is different than an individual's right to free speech. I don't think a church or a politician should have this or a business should have the same free speech as an individual. I think those are individual rights and yes. they're not meant to be platformed. As you know an organization, uh, you are endorsing things at right. that point. And so your endorsements umbrella other people, whether they are in or out of your group. And so right. if you do choose to endorse those things, you have to stand by them, much like you stood by Mike Diana. You stood by that. Even if he moved on from you, you did a great service in doing so. We couldn't talk about what we're talking about, probably. I couldn't look at a terrible picture of Batman being Shrek's baby daddy. I couldn't, you know, watch Super Jail. I couldn't do a lot of things. And, hey, even people who don't know who Mike Diana is, a lot of things that you might like, all these memes on the internet, all these shitty things on Reddit that you ugly laugh about and then you close your browser and clear it up, it wouldn't be there without this part of history yeah i'm proud of what we did i'm definitely proud of what we did there that's not something that i have any debate about like should i apologize like the might is right stuff or is there something to be sorry about there and i'm not necessarily sorry about that stuff either but that's a different thing than this i'm very proud of what we did as far as that as far as all this stuff went because you're right about that. It, it, it's, it's a, you have to fight back. And we did a hell of a good job fighting back for being too white trash tra trailer trash. Both of us born and living in trailers. You know, for trailer trash, we did a pretty good job, you know, doing what we did. And, um, yeah, I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> it's, inter it. it's interesting that sometimes the free speech and censorship within circles such as art comes out of convenience you feel like you st not you not me but many times now especially because of the internet people will endorse and condemn things based on what they like and dislike and they don't look at the bigger picture that what you are not endorsing just because you don't like it or you don't like that person might affect you in the long run. Right. I think that within satanic circles, there's a lot of this right now as well. Look at how saying, I like this, but I don't like what they believe in. It sort of hurts you when you do that, but then you erase other existing circles. Or bringing forward certain platforms, certain artists... And erasing others such as yourself, like how hell Satan sort of mirrors this incident. Oh, it's yeah. interesting that this episode is almost a bookend to our very first podcast episode. And it, it's interesting that history repeated itself 
And again, it might not be Penny Lane. It probably was Dougie and his twinsy twin, uh, Kevin, with their fucking green shirts telling them, hey, no, he wasn't a part of it. Actually, he was in it for the money or some shit like that. Yeah, well. Look at the the people in the documentary also. This is the last part of my rant here, but... uh, I saw that one figure who is in the documentary has recently gotten in the Bay Area a lot of gigs to perform. And I know their performances are not paid. They can call themselves a professional whatever all they want, but they're just getting exposure and getting out of the house because of this documentary. And without this, they didn't have anything else. And unfortunately, poor Mike, you know his time ran up there's a lot of obscene art out there there's a lot of things that surpass it because it's a different part of history now yeah and he's a piece of nostalgia that's true he's a one-trick pony for me um me being cut out of hell satan and me being cut out of the mike diana documentary if i look at it from an exploitive publisher part i'm like man we should be doing a documentary on that guy but the idea that people don't understand that like on me <laughs> because because of all I've done and and but the idea is that all joking aside semi joking aside it's like did you think a kind hearted nice person was going to be able to publish obscene books and and get them around like I did or do you think a kind hearted nice guy a polite nice guy was going to be able to push forward uh the satanic temple stuff or Satanism, as I did with even LeVay. No, I was a brute. I was a real motherfucker, and I really fought. I fought hard. As Heart Warrior Chosa would say from the Pacific North, or, or the Ojibwe clan up in Minnesota, she's like, you're the, you're the only white warrior I've ever met. And when I told her this story about the stuff I did, she goes, you really put yourself out there. And uh, it's amazing. You do it without anything but a cause. You know, there's no promise of gold on the other end. There's nothing. And and I've I've fought with people tooth and claw, like hard, to get these stories out there. Um, Mike Diana wouldn't have a documentary without me. There there would not there would not be one. And I know that. And that's the, the bigger part of it. And there would not be a satanic temple without me either. And I know that. I how that would ever pay my bills, I'm not sure. But credit where credit is due is a nice thing, you know. An invite to the party they're having for the film would have been a nice thing. You know, like when I when the Mike Diana documentary came out, I'm like, boy, I was telling my partner at the time, as all all said and done, I would have just been I would have just liked to have been invited to the premiere. Like to celebrate with them because I helped make that happen. No, you know, like away from artistic vision like we we don't see you in this you know we only see these people in it you know which i don't agree with but i wasn't even invited to the birthday party of the child i gave birth to you know which is to me just a weird fucking thing i think that it's a very human thing to expect even just just a nod just a fucking nod Or maybe just a personal thank you, like come over to your place and be like, hey, man, I'm sorry I've been wrapped up in this and this and this. Just say fucking face half the time would be an absolutely incredible thing to do for someone. Even if it's behind closed doors and not public, I feel like that's satisfying. Or like you were saying, an invitation that that would have spoke a lot and it wouldn't cost anything. Well, it might before the party, but still what? What harm would that be? And I think I, it tunes into that insecurity. Yeah, I, I like a lot of what you're saying. You know, you've given a lot of answers as to how this happens. But for me, even if it were behind the scenes, a, a card to me, I'd still probably hold some bitterness because, as much as they say exposure doesn't pay the bills or or stuff like that, well, but it exposure would validates everything to the world. Yeah, it would certainly help me. Like I, I could help, you know, maybe it would help me get a career somewhere or have a, you know, a, a longer life in the arts. I'm not sure. You know, it's a struggle to be an artist and a, a self-made artist and to not, not get help with from your brethren that 
do owe you it is is almost criminal to me i i feel like this is you know almost been criminal like you know but what do i do i'm personally not sure what the answer to that is but perhaps in closing of this episode i can pay it forward and i can say that i fully endorse and defend what you have to say I would not have Speak of the Devil podcast without Shane Bugby. And I can say here on the air, on the record, that I'm not going to erase your existence. Even if this podcast gets erased from something, I could even say out loud that I was part of this podcast with Shane Bugby. I own a book that was published by Mike Hunt Publishing and naturally by Shane Bugby. And it's the uh, Suffering and Celebration and it has it has portrayals of all kinds of people that Shane and his partner at the time had encountered in America. And the book has a tendency to open at the same spot. It's just an easy spot for the weight of the pages to open. And the majority of the time, if I just flipped open the book, it opens to Mike Diana's page. <sighs> And that in itself is physical proof of Shane knowing who Mike Diana is. And it is unfortunate that you had to put together and show your proof in your own documentation. But I do think that that's very good that you did because, you know, how history will show it, like you asked before, well... My Hunt Publishing exists, and it published this piece of material. Look on YouTube. There's this news article where Shane is defending Mike Diana. You can do a simple Google search to see it. And, you know, as far as artists who hold people back so they can get ahead... To get yet again another unpaid pat on the back. That's fine and dandy for how they feel. How their kin feel. But at the same time. When you are an artist. Who pays the bills. With your art. Day after day. Year after year. Such as Shane Bugby. And myself. We understand why. You are holding us back. And if that's what you need to get ahead, then have fun at your unpaid job, boo-boo. I've been <laughs> Nanerol. Next time, we're going to talk about Mike Hunt Publishing. And we'll talk about a little more of what he has published and how it's come full circle recently. Have a good one. Thank you so much, Shane. Thank you. Let's go have some pizza. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe and tune in to our next episode wherever you prefer to listen to podcasts. You can find us at Speak of the Devil Pod on Twitter and contact us at speakofthedevilpod at gmail.com. For Shane's artwork or to support his endeavors, please visit shanebugby.com or find him on Twitter at shanebugby. I've been Nanarol. Have a good one. Oh, and Shane is the devil. Dot com.